Hello and welcome to Climate Conversations. I'm Claire Nazir. In this show, we're tapping into the expertise of climate scientists and leaders and understanding more about the art of climate communication. The Exeter Climate Forum 2025 convened earlier this summer. Their mission, to connect and inspire bold ideas and approaches that will resonate into the heart of global climate action. Leading voices from science, policy, media and business came together, injecting expertise and clarity into shaping priorities for the upcoming COP30 and beyond. Alex Burkle attended the forum and spoke with climate experts, focusing on how climate communication can translate to meaningful climate progress. So Stuart, why is the University of Exeter hosting this event with the Met Office? So climate science has never been more important. We're seeing extreme weather events, the evidence of climate change before us increasingly, day by day. But at the same time, there's been an increase in those who aren't accepting that science, who are backing away from it, and that risks the action which is required to protect to limit the impact of climate change ahead. So what we're doing here is we're getting scientists and researchers together from around the world for some frank and open discussions about what that research is showing, what are the emerging themes which will be important to understand. And we're also getting those scientists together with business leaders, with policymakers, so that that research can inform the actions of those organisations and drive real change in the world ahead. So hoping to make big developments, but what are your biggest hopes from this uh, event? Above all, I think this is about the connections between people who are here, where we're seeing researchers talking with business leaders in the city of London, for example, and conversations about how their understanding of how the climate is changing can inform decisions made which really shape the direction of the economy. Conversations between researchers and those also with policymakers, which can influence the course of decisions of governments in this country and elsewhere to ensure that the science is factored in. So it's really about facilitating those conversations, enabling those connections to take place. With regards to climate com communication, what do you think the biggest challenges are? It's something which has been debated already quite extensively, and there are different views from we need to be very data-driven and accurate to other voices saying, actually, we need to be able to tell human stories. Mm. And that for many people, it's understanding how this impacts individuals, which will bring this to life and help people understand the change, which really is vital for us to deliver ahead. Yeah, I think you're right in as much as lots of people don't want to accept it until it's actually impacting them. So if we can bring it home, are you seeing any positive developments on that front? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, one of the things that came out of the business forum yesterday was immediate action involving uh, farming organisations, finance businesses, uh, research organisations and others to carry out research on how extreme weather events are increasingly impacting British agriculture and to see if more can be done to help protect farmers uh, who at the moment uh, have very, very little support if extreme weather events wipe out their crops, wipe out their income. So that was a really tangible thing. And already, you know, the next meetings are being set up, people are coming together. Um, so it was really good to see those tangible evidence uh, of success emerging already. So we are making good steps. Indeed. When you've been looking at how we communicate climate change and the science behind it, what have been your biggest surprises? Well, I think there's sort of a common sense assumption that we need to scare people. If we tell them the facts and just how bad climate change is, they will surely wake up and take action. Actually, we find that that can backfire. It can actually turn people off that they just don't want to hear it and they will just actively avoid information that they find unpleasant. Um, so actually, the more we can talk in positive terms about uh, the all the good reasons to take action, and that might be that it improves your health or it's good for your children's safety or it'll save you money, the more we find that people want to hear those messages and are more likely to act on them. Do you find it sometimes very difficult, though, to find that positive spin on things? Um, 
Not as much as you might think, actually. So there was some good work by IPCC that found that actually the vast majority of measures to tackle climate change have wider co-benefits, as they're called. So they're good for people's health, well-being, finances, um, social inclusion, various other kind of social benefits as well. Um, and so it, it's not actually very difficult to find common ground with any audience and then to sort of adapt your message to highlight things that are important to, to them as well. So have we seen an improvement in the uptake of knowledge? Um, well, I think there are encouraging signs that people are changing their behaviour in some areas. So we have seen a rise in plant based diets. We have seen electric vehicle adoption really rapidly take off. Um, and that's because those options appeal because they're healthier or because they could save you money. So there are other reasons, not primarily climate ones, that people are making those choices. And so that tells us then how we can encourage people to change other behaviours. It's about reducing the costs, about making them more convenient, more attractive, and people will then make those choices. So we're seeing some encouraging signs, but we need a lot more action particularly by policymakers, to make those options more attractive and cheaper. One challenge we often find is any individual might struggle to see how their own impact will have any change on what's going on when it's such a big thing. What, what's your little stance on that? I think that's absolutely true. And we, <clears throat> we do find that when we have studied climate anxiety, as people feel very sort of small and insignificant and like they can't make a difference. And that's, that's very frustrating. The more we can encourage people to take collective action, so to find like-minded people, to form a group or to join a group, um, the more likely they are to find social support and, and actually feel that they are part of a group of similar people. But also the more that group of people can be more effective because they're taking action collectively. Um, so that that's part of it, I think, is actually encouraging people into collective action. But also it's about even as an individual, some of these things can just be good for you. So it's again back to the co-benefits. You, you can actually encourage people to take environmentally friendly actions without necessarily talking about climate. So that's, that's the other way to, to approach it. So today we're all talking about communication and how we're getting the message of climate change across. Why is it so important that we're looking at how climate change is being communicated? So if we go back a few years, climate science was focusing on defining the challenge, defining the problem. Now climate science is really about the solution. It's about how we deal with climate change. And that involves everybody. It means we need policymakers to be talking to regulators, to be talking to climate service providers, to be talking to citizens and business owners. And they need to interact so that the climate science and the climate information we produce from that science is relevant and usable and people can act on it. And so it's all about making sure that people can understand it and make the changes that are needed. Oh, so much more. It's about making sure it's relevant in the first place. So increasingly, we're including the users of the science at the early stages so they can help to design the direction of the science with those people who we traditionally think of as, as the scientists. Actually, there's a voice in that for the other stakeholders, those users, those people who will benefit. By doing that, we, we, we're able to design more relevant science. So it's more relevant, it's more actionable. Are we seeing improvements as a result? Absolutely. Um, we're seeing more and more people actually pick up the data and the knowledge that we're producing. Um, we have one particular uh, project at the, at the moment, the Climate Data Portal at the Met Office. And we tried an experiment to actually involve more and more people in the design of this portal. And we listened to them. We used it to provide information in a way that's much more relevant, that can interface with their planning systems. And the number of users of that, it just increased so much more rapidly than any of our other data dissemination systems on climate. When it comes to communicating climate science, what are the biggest challenges that you face? I think for us, it's... Um, making sure that that information, which can be quite complex and overwhelming sometimes, we can make it more accessible for people in a way that they can understand and making it more um, easy for people to take actions. So that might be at their workplace or maybe it's um, at home, but also linking in as well with collaborating with their communities. So that might be 
with um, their sort of fellow peers, with, uh, with other staff members, or maybe in their local community as well, to make sure that we can all act together to take some of those actions forward. And do you see that things are getting better or harder from your point of view? There's always challenges, but now a lot more people understand why we have to take action and a lot more people understand the science and the rigour that's behind that. So we can really focus on sort of priorities that we need to take for net zero and we can begin to map that out now and see where are the things that are going to be the biggest wins in terms of reducing our um, emissions. So, for instance, at the university, one of the things that we're really beginning to think about is our scope three emissions. So particularly about how we work with our suppliers and that might be engaging through the local community or um, suppliers in the wider sense and how we can um, incorporate sustainable procurement actions into uh, what we buy and purchase and reduce what we need to buy in the first place. You can make that difference. What are the biggest challenges that you've discovered when it comes to communicating climate? There's an awful lot of negativity and doomism around future climate, and that's understandable. But that's a huge, huge barrier to communication because we all we all switch off. You know, we, we can't deal with too much doomism. Yes, climate has changed and a certain amount of further climate change is inevitable. However, the magnitude of future climate change is very much within our control as a, as a human species. You know, do we want to uh, work towards a, a, a stable climate in which there is good livable conditions for all, as David Lammy has commented on? Or are we going to let climate change, you know, continue unmitigated so that is huge agency we have many of the technologies we know what we need to do there are of course many you know political and other obstacles but that 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 point about agency choice the future is in our in our hands is one of the things that i always want to to emphasize and communicate to the public in particular Thank you for watching Climate Conversations. For more shows in this series, check out our Met Office YouTube channel. And Alex and I will be back soon.